Folks, welcome back to another exciting episode of Scotch on the Rocks. And about 10 months ago, when I started this uh, little live stream here, I, one of the first guys I ever reached out to was uh, Greg Fraser. And uh, Fraser was kind enough and graciously and awesome to come on. And we talked a lot of rock. So I thought it would be fitting to bring Fraser back um, for my first season one finale and um to bookend it with a uh, phrase and we got a lot of stuff to talk about including we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into uh the debut van halen which uh phrase has a ton of history with it and uh, we'll get into that shortly but uh phrase welcome back my friend oh uh, thanks for having me on deke uh it's a pleasure to be back and i like how you said i was your first guest like Basically the guinea pig, right? So if all things fail, let's just get him on and to get it over with, get, get the bugs out, and then we'll get some real guests on. <laughs> no, 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 no man. You're one of you're one of Scotch on the Rock's favorite guests, man. Whenever, <laughs> I, whenever I've reached out to you, you're always in. Whether it was through my WordPress blog, you you did the Brighton Rock stuff for me and uh, the Stormforce and whatnot. And but speaking of which, we got some news with uh, Stormforce. So. Tell us what's going on with it, because I know about a month ago, you guys finally, after two years, played your first live show. Yeah, it was, uh, that was our debut show. It was supposed to be our record release party, which was initially April of 2020. Mm -hmm. And that's, as you know, when COVID just kicked in. So we just thought, OK, well, a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, we'll do it again and just kept rescheduling and rescheduling and uh and then the, you know there was they were starting to open up a bit, but we didn't want to play in front of fifty you know percent of a crowd capacity mm -hmm. and stuff like that. We're hoping not to play with you know everybody having to wear masks and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we were hoping when April kicked around, which uh, just did, that would be the perfect opportunity, and it did. And all things aligned, and it went off without a hitch. It was a magical night, and uh, it was it was great to get that one under the belt, you know. So it was awesome, man. Too bad you weren't there, but uh, we'll do some more shows and hope to see you there. Did you happen to uh, record any of it, like, say, through the soundboard? We didn't. We didn't because we, we were kind of a little nervous, like, well, you know, let's just get this show out of the way, and then we can kind of dissect things. And, you know, your first show can be, uh, it can be sketchy sometimes because it's the first show, you know. Uh, I wish we kind of did looking back that we do have some live recording, but it's nothing worth like putting online and stuff like that. Like we have, we wanted some live stuff for us to hear just to make sure, you know, the endings were good. It's, it's, so when we do another show, it's kind of like a, something we could look at as a tool, mm -hmm. but, uh, but nothing it's worth this worth sound quality wise. It's worth releasing to the public. Ah, damn, I was going to hit you up for the tracks, but anyways, maybe next <laughs> time. But I have to ask you, I did look at the set list, and I noticed you guys uh, dropped in three Brighton Rock tunes. Now, I was just curious, um, you guys did, we came to rock, um, Can't Stop uh, the World. Can't Stop the Earth from Shaking. Sorry, yeah. Yep. And uh, Hanging High and Dry. My favorite tune, Hanging High and Dry. So... Who's, whose call was that? Because we know that Patrick can, he can sing the phone book and make it sound good. So yeah. did you, were you twisting and churning about, do I put Brighton stuff in or do we leave it out? Like, how did that all come about? Well, the, the, the record itself, our debut record, mm -hmm. uh, which you can get on stormforce.ca, by the way, but uh, it's only 45 minutes long and, and, you know, we're, we're, headlining a show we can't go up there and just play for 45 minutes and then right. say see you later you know so i didn't really want to do like a bunch of covers to fill out the set and and pat mentioned what about some bright rock and 
I was kind of on the fence, you know, because, you know, Jerry passed and uh, mm-hmm. it was kind of weird, but I thought, you know what, what better way to pay tribute to Jerry? And, and because now it's basically the only way to keep the name alive because, you know, mm-hmm. Brighton Rock's not getting played a lot on the classic rock radio and stuff like that. And uh, so if you want to hear some Brighton Rock, you're going to have to come and hear some Storm Force and stuff like that. So it kind of rounded out the set and I, I felt good that it was still original material. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, it felt good. You know, I was like, I, like I mentioned, I was kind of on the fence, but, uh, I'm glad we did it. Pat nailed it. I mean, he just, he nailed it and, uh, it felt good. It felt really good. You know, the band played really good on it and, uh, as well as the rest of the set, you know, I, I thought we, we did a really good job, you know? So it was exciting because the last time I played on stage was, uh, 2019 with Brighton rock at the monsters of rock cruise. Okay. And uh, so that's like, you know, good three years ago. And, you know, I'm used to somebody that's playing at least a few times every year. So that big uh, hiatus was, it was kind of nerve wracking coming back. I'll go, man, it's just, it's just it's weird. Cause there was a little while there. I thought, is this COVID thing going to be like this forever now? I mean, cause you know, I don't, it's COVID's like the flu. It's, it's, you're never, it's never going to just disappear now. It's going to be just like the flu. It's always going to be kind of be lingering around. And I thought for a while, is it going to be like, we're going to be wearing masks for the rest of our lives. And, you know, yeah. like, so, you know, but everything played out and uh, back to your question. Yeah. Uh, it was basically Pat's the one who brought it up. Let's do some Brighton rock. And I went, okay, let's, let's give it a shot. We rehearsed it when, I, when you know, we rehearsed it to, to make sure it was going to be okay. And the guys nailed it. And it's like, yeah, let's do this, man. The crowd went crazy. I mean, nobody yeah, was, yeah. nobody, nobody was expecting it. And yeah. uh, it was, it was a great tribute to Jerry and I'm so glad we did it. And uh, you know, so. And it's like you said, it's about keeping the music alive, you know, like you got us guys, you know, we'll always know like Brighton rock and, and, uh, you know, but it's like you said, you, you just don't want it to be forgotten because obviously it was a big thing in not only your world, but a lot of our world. I mean, you guys almost, well, we had a couple of gold records and, you know, you guys did really, really well. So, yeah, you know, like, thank you. Yeah. You got to, you just got to keep it going. And that's, that's so awesome. That's kind of why I was sneaking around asking you if you had a, any soundboard recordings, but <laughs> <laughs> not, not at this point, we should have videotaped it. I had a few people, Hey, you want my video? It's like, oh, okay, whatever. There's people going around with the phones. I'm surprised that there's not a, some stuff on YouTube, but uh, yeah, uh, it was a great night, man. I wish uh, you would have been there. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Um, so where are we at with the recording of uh, the follow-up to age of fear? Well, uh, we've got nine songs kind of ready to go. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, you know, the drums are done on them. The bass is done. I just, I've did got to do some guitar parts. Uh, the vocals, most of it's done. We're still tweaking stuff here and there. But, you know, I got to admit, when, when COVID kicked in and everything, it kind of it kind of put a damper on the, like, the writing process. Like, like the, how would you put it? Like, I don't know, incentive is the right word, but, you know, before COVID kicked in, there was always a drive to, to write and create and stuff like that. And uh, I, I found once, you know, when COVID was kicking in, it was, you know, it was, it was, the world was depressed, depressing. And and it was, it was starting to affect me as a songwriter also. I, I just didn't have inspiration like normal. And uh, so it kind of put things, you know, made things kind of, I wouldn't say stale, but kind of the momentum was kind of lost because we were rolling there for a while and then it just kind of yeah. like, ah, but now we're getting, we're, it's getting back into gear again. Uh, I don't know if you, if you noticed, but uh, we, we mentioned there was a one day Pat's sent me the song just with him. I'm not going to say who it is, but it's, it's him covering a song. Uh, it's a female singer and he did his version of it just to him on a piano I went, holy Jesus, with no intentions of re-recording. Oh, Pat, man, that sounds goddamn awesome. So then, you know, because the record's taken, you know, a little longer, he said, well, why don't we re-record that and just put that on in between records? So uh, we recorded it, and the only thing left on that is just my guitars. I'm still not happy with what the, my guitars, uh, uh, the ideas I'm coming, but uh, it's a cover song. Uh, it's a song everybody knows. And uh, so I've been kind of wanting to get that out of the way and then 
dive back into the storm force thing because everybody works so hard on this cover song uh, I don't want to say what it is in case it, it doesn't happen. And then people are going to go, hey, what happened to that? You know, <laughs> so, but it's close. We're very close. Mm -hmm. And then once that's done, we're going to hunker right back down and get the ball rolling with the, the rest of the Storm Force record and get it out there. I'm hoping to have it out, you know, the beginning of, of 2000, uh, 2023, which would be the three-year anniversary of the first record. So yeah. we'll yeah. So we'll keep fingers crossed, man. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, please uh, tell us about the new drummer. Well, uh, Roger Banks, he's an old friend. Uh, when Brighton Rock first started way back in, I think we started in 83-ish, um, uh, in Hamilton, we'd, we'd rehearse there, plus in Niagara Falls. But in Hamilton, there was a band, uh, it was called Sarazen, and they're still around to this day. They're legends in, in Hamilton area. And... Uh, and Roger would play with those guys. And he, so he was always around. He's a fantastic drummer, like jaw dropping. Like he does, if you go on YouTube, he has drum clinics and stuff like that. So right. he's, he comes from like the Neil Peart school of drumming. So he can play all that fancy stuff, but he can play Phil Rudd too. You know what I mean? It's not just, he doesn't overplay. He plays what's meant to be played. Great tone, great guy. Uh, yeah, so we, we made a drummer change with Brian. Uh, there, that was just basically musical differences. Brian's still brothers with us and stuff like that. And uh, so uh, I reached out to Roger, and he goes, yeah, man, I'm in. So we sent him a track, and uh, he laid some drums down and went, wow, okay, there you go. L listen to that, you know. And then we just sent him more and more and more. And then uh, now we're like, he's got nine songs completed. And like I mentioned, wow. then, yeah, so we're getting pretty close, you know. Hey. So hoping to be mixing it by maybe fall, the record, hoping to be all done by then. But we're, you know, we don't want to rush it. I know it's been three years, but <laughs> <laughs> but that I swear to God, those three years, it was like a blink of an eye. I mean, it just seems like a year ago that our record got released. But uh, yeah, so, you know, when the record's done, it's I'm hoping it'll be worth the wait for everybody. Well, I'm sure it will be. I mean, the debut is killer. And if anybody wants to get a copy of it, it's still available at the Stormforce site. And uh, yep. I mean, you guys could even, you know, hit uh, phrase up at his Facebook page and he'd, he'd steer you in the direction. You, you really need to hear it. And, uh, you know, I really got to come down and hear you guys live. Uh, that's, you know. Yeah. Plus, plus we're on all the, all the, the streaming sites, Spotify and Amazon, all the, everyone yeah. you can think of we're on there too. If you're not into the CDs anymore, which I still am. I still love them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a stream stream guy, but I stream cause I like it. Cause I can try it before I buy it. Right. Oh, that's awesome. That's so awesome. and I and I'm a vinyl guy. So right. I I've, I've skipped over CDs now. I've gone back to vinyl. But to discover new bands like Dirty Honey and that that's that's what streaming for me is great because I'm still a full out album guy. I I don't do playlists. I just can't. My daughters think I'm some kind of freak. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's all good. But you, you know it, what I. I like streaming because of that. You could, like you said, you can hear it before you buy it. Yeah. But I, I found a lot of my favorite records back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, my, a lot of my favorites, like, would take a while to grow on me. Like at first listen, I went, hmm, I'm not sure if I like this. I like a couple, but like, then you die and you play it a few more times, and then it's like, oh, wait a minute, and then all of a sudden these songs you're not sure about are like, wow, this is amazing, you know? Yeah. And I, I find that with streaming it's it's so disposable now you listen to the intro of a song it's like nah nah next yeah and, and that's it you never go back to that song ever again yeah. you never give it that chance so uh you know the, that's kind of weird but it's just the way it is today man it's uh, everything's disposable so. and speaking of albums we have we brought phrase on tonight to talk about the debut look at that and halen so I thought when I was putting this together with you and I reached out to you and you said, yeah, for sure, man, I'd love to come on and talk about it. I thought, you know what? I think I need to go to the bullpen and uh, bring this guy on. Oh, wow. Oh, no. You didn't tell me he's coming. It's, it's a surprise guest. Oh, my God. Brent, <laughs> what the hell? What's up, Brent? <laughs> You're always tricking me. Last time you had Sean Kelly and Andy Kern. Jesus, is, is that it? You got any more guests? Is it is it just Brent? Because Brent's more than enough, man. 
<laughs> I hope so. My um, brother Brent, I love this guy, man. Uh, he's got the smooth radio voice, you know. If you listen to my voice, it's kind of hard sounding, but you listen to Brent's. Hi, this is this is Brent Jensen. You're listening to Ambrosia and Light FM. I'm afraid to, I'm afraid to talk now. <laughs> oh, right Jeez. on, Brent. Nice to see you, brother. Good right to on. you, man. Right I was on. very honored to be asked to do this. Um, and when you know Deke told me about it, I was like, yeah, this is a, it's definitely a. It's a no-brainer. So nice, great, good to see awesome, you, man. right yeah. on. Great to see you. And you know what? It was it was really. And speaking of no-brainers, it was a no-brainer for me to ask Brent because if you, I know uh, Greg, you you follow his his awesome podcast and oh yeah, and He's been uh, a guest a couple yeah, times. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and you know, and Brent's written about Van Halen. Um, or sorry, he spoke about Van Halen on mm -hmm. his uh, podcast and stuff. So I thought, you know what? It would be great to have you guys go at it. And I can just kind of sit back and uh, moderate. <laughs> you know? Well, well the, the record you're, you're was smart. the record was 1978, I believe, right? Is that right? It I'm was. Sure. And, yeah. fellas, also available on cassette. Oh. <laughs> Look at that. Wow. Old-time hockey. <laughs> awesome. this, this is this is the actual cassette that i bought in i believe i want to say um probably 1979 in the u.s at a truck stop as we were on summer vacation and uh traveling through the southern u.s i don't remember exactly where but you know remember you guys remember those like you used to stop at these diners and stuff like that yeah. and they had those cassette things that rotated remember okay, those and yeah, there was like yes. three and then maybe nine deep and sure. you would like spin it and look, yep. and and this was in there, and I thought wow. that looks that looks cool. And I didn't know anything about Van Halen. I was I think, oh jeez, uh, and I bought it and brought it back to the hotel and uh, listened to it on my crappy little Walkman, and, and it blew my mind. No, yeah, absolutely, it's same as me. I mean, I, uh, in 1978, I would have been 15 years old, so I would have been playing guitar probably a good five years by then. And before yeah. Van Halen, you know, I was learning from Jimmy Page and Richie Blackmore and Jeff Beck and Tom Schultz and, you know, maybe mm. Brian May and stuff like that. So when that record came out, I, I, I heard it uh, a 97 Rock in, out of Buffalo, which is nice. like 30, 30, set, 30 minutes from my house here. It, 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 all you hear is eruption and then going in the you really got me and it's like what the heck is that i thought it was guitars mm. i thought it was guitar synthesizers or something i thought there's well he's yeah. not he's not playing with a pick he's not like i just couldn't believe it so that's that's one of those records when it first came out being a guitar player it just stopped you in your tracks like what the heck am i hearing here man uh yeah. it, it's it's nothing like you can't you can't listen to that record and think well he's that he sounds like this. He sounds like that. No, he didn't sound like anybody. One of a kind. Uh, and then uh, when they came uh, came through to Niagara Falls, New York, I got to see him on the first tour opening for Black Sabbath, blowing the doors off him. There you go. <laughs> on that tour, I believe, too, right? That yeah. was yeah. that was Black Sabbath's last tour. And uh, Van Halen was so hungry, man. Like, when they came mm. on stage, they were just on fire fire like just so hungry to get noticed because back then there's no videos you couldn't see them live anywhere you couldn't you know like people take it for granted now with youtube and all that kind of stuff you can just click yeah. on and, and see you know last night's concert you can't you couldn't do that back then there was zero live footage all you have was some photographs and circus and hip rate and stuff like that so that's right and then when they came on stage, being a guitar player, like I'm, I'm like about ten rows back in front of Eddie. I'm like, oh my god, wh what the hell? And then Black Sabbath came on and just phoned it in. It was awful. We, I don't, I don't even think we even watched half the show. We walked out. Oh wow. no, really? Yeah, that's you awful. Know, you know what? It, well, because Van Halen was so energetic, like running around the stage. I mean. I think I'm not sure if Eddie had double stacks or triple stacks, like a wall behind him. And during mm. his solo and stuff, he was literally like, like, he, like, it's like he's checking something into the boards. He's checking into the cabinets. The cabinets are going like this. There must have been somebody behind the cabinets trying to Hold keep them from up. falling over. And it was just like, oh my, this guy's crazy, right? And then Black Sabbath comes on. They're standing there, and and uh, one thing I remember, which was kind of weird, you know, Ozzy's always in the center of the stage. Yeah. You know, Tony's on right one side, and Geezer's. 
Well, this concert, he starts off the center stage and then gradually went to where uh, he would leave the stage every time Tony would go into a guitar solo. All of a sudden, that Ozzy's gone. And mm. then he, he'd come back out, but he wouldn't go to the center stage. He would stand where Tony was. And Tony would be center stage. And, so, and as soon as Tony starts doing his lead, boom, he's off stage again. So I don't know if he's, you know, doing some rails or puking yeah, or probably. whatever was going on, but it was very odd. Wow. And yeah, they just phoned it in. It's like, okay, let's get this show. I, I, I don't even know why they didn't, you know, get rid of Van Halen because it was it was so obvious they're getting blown away. And apparently it was like that every every night of the tour from what I've heard. Yeah. So. Did they not eventually toss them off the tour because they were just getting blown out every night? They must have because I I couldn't see why they wouldn't. I mean, you're a headliner and the blo- you know, opening band is just making you look like a bunch of plugs up there, you know. So yeah, yeah. I th- I thought somebody had told me that they did get kicked off that tour yeah, eventually. You would have to. <laughs> it was embarrassing yeah. for them. Yeah. yeah. But I'm sure at one point they were probably piggybacking off Van Halen because there's probably such a buzz and it was selling tickets. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was it was selling tickets, but but yeah, so it came out February, and I think the concert I went was September, so it wasn't that much longer. And mm-hmm. you got to remember, back in 1978, if you're looking at the Billboard charts, like I think number one was like "Staying Alive" by the Bee Gees and stuff like that, yeah. like you know, ABBA and and Billy Joel and Randy Newman and all that, you know, it, like yeah. just bubblegum. Like there was no hard rock or like making a big dent on the radio, so. There wasn't yeah. like well, the school I went to. Everybody, you know, I a lot of most of the people were all into the disco. So there's a small little pocket of us that, that were into the hard rock that knew who Van Halen was and couldn't wait to go see him. So, yeah. So I, I know they were, you know, it's probably ten, twelve thousand people at the show, and I think probably eight thousand were there to see Van Halen, man, because you could hear it between songs like ah! <laughs> the wow. craziness. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. They, it how, was awesome. How cool is it that you were there? Yeah. I know, right. man. I, I was like, you know, when the concert's over, like the next week or you're just buzzing on it. It's like, oh, my God, what did I just see? Because it's yeah, it's such a, I don't know, shock to the system, whatever you want to call it. But it was, it carried me over and it just lit a fire under me. Like, wow, man, now I got to really up my game because how do you even compete with somebody like that? And, yeah. you know, you, like I said, you can't go on YouTube and figure out what he's doing. You got to literally hunker down and slow the record down and whatever you got to do to learn that kind of stuff. But uh, oh, it was man. wild. And then, then uh, two years later, or when I was 18, I got to see Randy Rhodes with Ozzy. So that was, a you know, that was <laughs> Look at you. Yeah, wow. man. Yeah. So Where? that was Toronto? Uh, Kitchener, Center in the Square. Uh, uh, I think, I think Queen's. <laughs> Queen wow. City, Queen City Kids, I think, might have been the opening band, if I'm not mistaken. That's cool. Mis- yeah, but uh, yeah, so Eddie was, you know, I've seen Eddie, I mean, the band Halen after that, you know, once they started to make it, they started to calm down. And then I remember seeing him, I think it might have been 95 with Sammy Hager. It was like the reunion tour. That yeah, was a, that one. Is that the one of Cops Coliseum? Uh, they did Cops on a, a second leg, I think, or a third leg. They, they did um, uh, the ACC. Okay, because I here seen... for. I remember at, at the end of the show, Hagar said, "Hey, we're here for four nights, and we're going to rip your city apart." At the end of the show, and everybody right. was like, "What?" Yeah, so they're staying in Toronto for four nights for some reason. I don't know why, but he said that as they were, you know, the, doing the big bow, he said it into the spe- into the mic, and I was like, "Holy shit, really?" Wow. Yeah. So when I see him at cops there, it was a mess. Eddie was, I don't know if he was on drugs or whatever. I was watching to see if he was drinking, but he wasn't. I kept thinking between songs, he must be pounding the booze, but he wasn't. So I don't know yeah. what the, if it was on pills, but it was a mess. He would start a song. It's like, what song is that, man? And then his guitar solo was sloppy as hell. It was so disappointing. Eh? And uh, yeah, it's like, what the heck's going on, man? It, what what it, happened? You know, it, it it was you're right. It was weird. It was um, he did a lot of weird stuff. He left the stage and he tried to pull one of the cabinets down, oh. and then he came out with this sign that said "Eat Healthy." Like it, he was just people were saying like, "What's wrong with him?" He seemed like he was B- kind of bizarre. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But back to that record, man. Talk about oh, a game yeah. cha- game changer. I mean, if you talk to any, any guitar player of our age, you're you know, that one really cemented the uh, guitars. You know, everybody wanted to be Van Halen after that, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, still still to this day. It's one, and not only that, it was the guitar sound, too. 
uh, you couldn't walk into a Long McQuaid's or Steve's and, and just grab an amp and plug in and get a really great, huge sound like that. So, mm. yeah, I mean, now you can. I mean, I got a little practice, a Marshall amplifier that cost me like 80 bucks. It sounds unbelievable, you know. Yeah. But back then, yeah. you couldn't get anything like that. Even the Marshalls back then were a little, you had to get them modded. Like, he got all his all his modified. All, yeah, all so. modded. And, well, and the Frankenstrat, too, of course. Oh it's everything about it, it like is everything it was so different you know oh, yeah did i, I tell you guys, all did of I, that stuff I, about him did Go i tell ahead. you guys i, I got a uh, i got the frankenstein you have oh, the one? one yeah is the red oh, one a, here i'll show it to you i think is it i said i think i saw this it's a little one right <laughs> there it is. that's awesome man <laughs> that is yeah. cool i like that that's very cool. Yeah, and it's right down to his actual specs in it. You can see the wires coming out of the, the pickups. No, yeah. I want one. I want and one. Is there like <laughs> cigarette, cigarette burns in the headstock? The cigarette burns right there. No yeah. way. That yeah. is That's so great. cool, man. My buddy T-Bone got me for a birthday gift. That's Jeez. Awesome. Yeah, so sorry to derail it conversation <laughs> oh, no. going, what? he has a frankenstein <laughs> <laughs> you know it's funny like the original one the white one i guess uh i remember reading an interview uh might, might have been guitar world or something like that and and the, the guys at eddie's house he's going hey whatever happened to because i think for the second record i don't know if it was the same he had that black one with the yellow stripes i think that might have been mm. a, a, a different guitar and yeah what happened to that the, the white one there he goes oh uh i think it's in this closet over here he opens up a closet it's just not even on a stand or in this it's not even in the case it's just leaning against the wall like you know, you know that's a legendary guitar uh, right <laughs> yeah. i know right but you know, that's just eddie is like ah, it's just over there whatever right <laughs> he, yeah. that, that second guitar that you were talking about i think was that the one that appeared on women and children first you remember that black ibanez destroyer he used to have well, the second guitar and the second uh, uh, Van Halen two, he's got a black a black strat with the yellow stripes instead of the white oh. with the black. Remember that? Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Th yep. There that's you it. go. That's it. Yeah. 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 yeah I remember yeah. the one you're talking about. Uh, yeah, the Destroyer. I guess uh, he he did a he did some he wanted to make it look different, so he did some hacking on it, and he ruined it. He said he ruined it when he did that for. Like he couldn't use it after that. Somehow it affected the sound so bad. He loved the sound of it, but once he started trying to chop it away to give it a different look, it ruined the sound. He never got to use it. He just used it for pictures. Yeah, so. You know who ended up with that guitar? The, Chris the, Holmes the, from Wasp. Yeah. No, why him? They must have listened. I, probably partying together, right? Probably partying. Probably. All those yeah. guys were like, you know. Yeah. And so the story goes, I guess, that he had modded it and he didn't like the way that it sounded and he gave it to Holmes. Okay. <clears throat> and Holmes said, I like, I couldn't even play it the way that he had it set up with the strings and the action and all the, you know, he, he said it was just so bizarre the way that he had, you know, set this guitar up that I, I couldn't even play it. I, I gave, I think he gave it back to him. Actually. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Wow. That guitar would be worth some heavy money right now. Right. <laughs> I bet you Chris, you know, I don't think he's rolling in money anymore. He probably wants no, that. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> he put that on <laughs> if he put that on eBay, he could get some pretty pennies for that. <laughs> hey, so phrase, I wanted to ask you now, when you caught Van Halen opening for Sabbath, did you go into that show as already a Van Halen fan, or was it oh yeah? Like I said, the record came out uh I think it came out in February. Uh, of nine uh, of nineteen seventy eight, and we the concert was in September. Right. So yeah. So when the record came out, it was already like I mentioned, it was on ninety seven rock. So you know, the, the next day, I'm already down at the record store going, "Hey, you got Van Halen? No, not in, not in, in it." So I, every day, I'd be down there. Finally, came in like, "Oh my god!" So you know, mm. like, like we were mentioning earlier about streaming, you couldn't do that. So the, all I knew was the eruption, and and you really got me. So then from then on. You're hearing every song. It's like, what the heck am I hearing, man? Like, you know, Atomic Punk. It's like, what the hell is this? You know, like, like everything was just so different than anything you've ever heard before. Like, you know, even weren't like, those, like, weren't those just the best days when you waited at the record store for an album to pop yeah. up? Yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah man. I'd pestered it. Oh, not you again. I'd walk in. No, it's not in. Like, I, I barely got one foot in it. No, it's not in yet. 
Okay, see you tomorrow, right? <laughs> it's not like they're going to phone you. Hey, man, the record's in, you know. Yeah, exactly. You have to literally show up and go, hi, it's me again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I miss That's those funny. days for sure, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you go shopping with your mother or something like that, and she wants to, okay, well, I'll just be in the record store and let me know when you're done. You're just like, you know, just like, oh, what is this? What is this? What is this? You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, man. man. I remember going yeah. to Toronto because when you know I was a huge Zeppelin fan. Just because I knew Toronto, there was Led Zeppelin bootlegs, and you could never get that around Niagara Falls and uh, St. Mm. Catharines area, like in any record stores. But there was a few stores that I read about that had bootlegs, so I'd go there hunting for Led Zeppelin bootlegs, man, Jimmy Page bootlegs, and I miss those days, man. You get one, oh my god, live from the BBC or whatever it was, you know, it's like live, yeah. you know. Oh yeah, I missed all that for sure. Wow. Yeah. Wasn't there a really great store in Hamilton called Cheapies? Do you remember oh, yeah. that phrase? Was it uh, good? Well, it was very small. It was like it was like a yeah. records on wheels, but you would get you would find a lot more imports and stuff like that. They would they, right. that the, the Sam the Record Man wouldn't have, you know. Same with the records on wheels and stuff like that and Sunrise. Well, not Sunrise didn't really have as many imports. But uh, yeah, cheapies and uh and records on wheels. Yeah, that's where you can get some obscure like stuff from the UK that you couldn't you know, you'd read about it in magazines, but you could never find here. So exactly. that was kind of, yeah. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. yeah. I'd never been. I'd always been told about it. And it was like, oh, i got to go to this place. And then it closed. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, it's, and it's even like growing up here in, in uh, Thunder Bay. Mm. I mean, we used to have, we had Sam's and we had, well, you guys would probably know, like uh, Music City. We had a a Records. We had, at one point, we had, then you had your mom and local mom pop local shops and it was so thriving and then next thing you know it just down to one and that's called sunrise and it's like not much yeah. of an option here in town anymore it's amazon or hunting around for used or going out of town and, and finding record stores like i i did this once covid hit and the record stores are um just trying to support local so i hit up encore records in kitchener bought some stuff uh, record store in Montreal, I hit up, and you know what? I mean, they're still out there. You just got to look. Sure. For them. Yep. Yeah. Where yeah. I where I live, man, it just it sucks. And even Record on Wheels, I I know what you're talking about, phrase with imports and stuff. But that Record on Wheels only lasted here for about oh, maybe two three years in the early night and sorry in the early eighties, and and it really? was gone. But yeah, you know, I don't know what happened, and it was a bummer because that place was the first place I discovered. Iron Maiden Killers back like 41 mm -hmm. years ago. Wow. And my buddy that I was with, he, we couldn't buy both records. So we made a deal. I said, okay, I'll buy Iron Maiden Killers. And he bought um, Def Leppard uh, on through the night. So then right. he, we did the old record swap Smart. and taped it on the cassette. <laughs> you taped it off each other. That was you such a her. scam, man. When you're a yeah. kid, you buy this one, I'll buy that one. We'll tape them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Because yeah, we, yeah. So stealing shoplifting wasn't really an option for us back then, so we, we had to so, make it work right. <laughs> for, for the record, I did. I did not. I, I bought the Brighton Rock records. I did not tape them. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I think I probably made twenty cents <laughs> off you. <laughs> Maybe not even. <laughs> and, and for the record, I bought them on tape. Oh, look, oh, at, look that. at that! Right on. There you go. Right. Is that awesome. the the Canadian one? Yeah. We yep. okay, yeah. For some reason, nice. the, the the first record, uh, Young Wilder Free. If you buy the American version, which was uh, released on Adco Atlantic, I don't know why it sounded way better. The cassette uh, somehow, I don't know if it was during mastering or somehow they or they're using better cassettes itself. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> I was watching uh, We Came to Rock the video the other day, and I'll, I'll tell you, man, like nobody's having more fun than you in that video phrase. <laughs> like, it's just, it's so great. And I, I thought back to when I was a kid watching that and just going, that guy looks like he's having such a good time. Uh, well, it, it know, was a, that it shot was... of you with the guitar. Like it, it was, it's fantastic. I always thought that was really cool. Well, that's 1986. So I'm thinking what am I, I uh, would have been like 23 years old and mm -hmm. I'm living my dream. I mean, literally my dreams are coming true. I'm thinking, wow, man, we're on a major record label. It's our, our first video. And they're saying, yep, it's uh, Mitch, uh, much music wants to hear it. You know, it's like, wow, I can't believe this is happening. And it got to the point where I was getting, like, you, you know, you're saying having a good time where 
the director and the manager's going, hey, man, you got to take it down a notch. Cause, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Me That's and funny. Screebs. Yeah, because we were just going for it. And it's like, you guys got to kind of calm down a bit. You, you know you know that saying, and uh, I, I heard a term in, uh, in the NFL, that you get these young rookies, they get a touchdown, they start dancing around and, you know, making a big thing, and they get the veterans go, hey, yeah. man, you know, act like you've been there before. You know what I mean? Like, and that's yeah. that's what they're saying to me during the video. Like, you know, kind of take it down. You know, like, like be cool. You know, like you're kind of trying too hard. You know, so I try to keep that in mind. But meanwhile, I'm going. I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this. Is happening. <laughs> yeah, that's so, great. Yeah, living the but, dream. You know, on 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 the flip side, uh, it, that does um, speak to the fact that like it, it kind of it makes it accessible. I guess is what I mean. So when I was watching that as a kid, you see a lot of posing and you've got the, especially during that point, obviously with the Aquanet and the, the makeup and all this, all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Right? Oh yeah, man. So for somebody to like, you know, be having a genuinely good time while they're playing music was cool to see instead of, you know, duck face and, you know, all the, like po all the posing and the stuff. So I thought it was great. Yeah. And the but thing I do is know what you mean about about screams there there's a part in the video where it's a, like a, a long shot and you turn around and you walk over to screams and say something to him and you have your back to the camera right and i was like you guys are just like having your own little party over there oh yeah yeah that's funny yeah we're brothers man when like even today we're we're just texting each <clears throat> other jokes i texted him uh I heard a, a version of Ann Wilson do uh, a version of Bridge of Sighs by Robin Trower, which I don't know if you oh, guys nice. are familiar with that record. It's, it's, a, it's a masterpiece. It's like, hey, man, check this out, you know. And yeah, we're still – he still lives 10 minutes from my house to this day. I've oh, known that's him, cool. I, I've known him since – we've been brothers since I was 15, we were 15, 16 years old, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I mean, it was like I mentioned. It was the dream come true, you know. So, what you're seeing is genuine. There's no pose in there. We're literally going, "Can you believe we're doing this? I like, can't believe this." That's very cool, man. <laughs> oh yeah. And then when then you know gets released, you don't, you have no idea when it's going to be on Much Music. So I would literally put VHS tapes uh, in the VCR, just press record and record two hours, two hours, two hours, just one after another, hoping to, and then if it did come on, I want to hear what they're saying. Or, you know, here's the new one. And what's, because now you get instant feedback. Back then, there's zero feedback. You mm. know what I'm saying? You put a record, it gets released. There's no, there's no feedback at all. There's nobody going, hey, man, unless somebody knows your number, go, hey, man, I got your record. It sounds great. Like, you're literally going, How's it doing? Like we have no idea if it's selling. We don't. There's nobody talking to us now. You know, it's with the social media, it's you know, you put a video out within seconds. Hey, man, great video! You're like you're you getting mm. instant feedback. You know, yeah. and you can see how many likes. You can tell if it's you know genuine. You know, getting viral or whatever. But back then, you had no idea, man. Whether people liked it or hated it, we're laughing at it, and you're just kind of. And you don't know until you start doing some shows and then, you know, then we'd start noticing more and more attendance and stuff like that. Like, Hey, we're starting to do good. Like people are really starting to take notice of us, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Would your manager not report stuff like that back to you at all? Yeah. But it, it's not a daily thing. You would, oh, you, would yeah. you know what I mean? Like it's stuff like record sales. Like how many did we sell? Like, well, we don't know. We don't know. I don't know what it was. Maybe, you know, in a month or something like that, but yeah. You don't know, like, because how do you how do you tally tally every record store across the country? Like, hey man, how many Bright Rocks albums did you sell yesterday? You know, you yeah, have to. You yeah. can't really do that, right? So, you ship yeah. out you ship out X amount of records, but you don't know how many are 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 being actually sold. I mean, you remember the old days? Yeah, we shipped platinum. Okay, that's well right. that's you know I mean that doesn't mean you sold platinum. That that's means right. you, that means you put a hundred thousand records in the stores. Doesn't mean and they people, might come back. They might all come back. That's what happened with yes. the. I remember uh, with the uh, the Kiss solo records. Yeah. You know, That's remember right. that? Is it? Yeah. They, yep. they're all they're all plat in, instantly platinum. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a funny story because they they build that as being you know they they shipped platinum so like they're already sold. What they didn't tell the public was that a lot of those records came back. Right. Because they were yep. not sold. Yeah. So interesting mm -hmm. spin. Totally, Absolutely. totally. Hey, Phrase, you know, going back to um, about a month ago, I had uh, was fortunate enough to talk to Andy Curran about uh, Envy and Nun, and I asked him about the process of sequencing songs on a record. Um, 
case in point, you look at the debut Van Halen album, and the songs are not in order. Now, I read the the Ted Templeman book, and I think he kind of said in there that, you know, back then they would have their list of songs, and they say, yeah, this is the running order, and then they would send it to the you know the art department. They'd print up the record, but in between that time, the the band would say, well, maybe we'll adjust these songs. So the songs were never in that order of what was originally printed on the album cover. I was just wondering how it worked for you guys in Brighton Rock. Like who had the final say? Because there was like five of you guys. Well, huh, I don't know about final say. Usually it would be me and Jerry, our singer. We, you know, because we wrote all the music and, and, and lyrics or Jerry wrote all the lyrics, stuff like that. We were mostly, I wouldn't say closest to it, but we kind of had a feel for it. But, you know, the manager wanted to put their two cents in and the record company wants to put their two cents in. But we were, we were I miss those days of vinyl because, you know, yeah. you got side one and side two. Now those days are gone. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you, you come out with a rocker and you come out the next song, maybe it's like a mid tempo. Then you might do a ballad third or fourth song and then you end, you know, with a rocker. Okay, there you go. There's side one, intermission, now side two, you know. So that's, even when we did the Storm Force record, I still approached it that same way. Like it was side one and side two. So like even, there is 10 songs, but I approached it side A, here's side A, here's the first five songs, and here's the second five songs. And it is, if you're still into that, listening to records as a whole, which most people don't do not do anymore, you know. It's very important because, you know, you love your that opening song. Wow, this song's killer. But by the third song, you could lose them, and that's it. Mm-hmm. You're done. They don't even want to hear the rest of the record, right? So some people save some of the best songs till the, till the end of the record, and that could hurt you, you know, because people might not get that far. But, uh, yeah, sequencing is, is very important back then, you know, um, because it's like a movie. It's it's little chapters. You know, that's the way I look at it. You know, you, you're building things and, and up and down plateaus and stuff like that. You know, so yeah. so you're saying you're saying that, that that Van Halen record was not sequenced. It was just random. Yeah. So the the opening track that's printed on the back of the the vinyl, and actually I pulled out all my Van Halen records with Roth and uh, yeah, um, the debut has you really got me. As the opening track, right? Followed by yeah. Jamie's crying, on fire, running with the devil. I'm the one. Ain't talking about love. Little dreamer, feel your love tonight. Atomic pump, sorry, atomic punk, eruption, and then ice cream man. And there's the record. Right. Wow. Yeah. That's so weird. That is weird. The only the only song that's the same sequence wise is ice cream man. I think, isn't it? You got her. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I couldn't goodness. imagine hearing that that album any other way than running with the devil with that that car horn starting. Mm, yeah, yeah, doop, yeah. Doop, yeah. Doop. yeah. Yeah. So if we want to keep it going for a quick second here, you guys uh, don't mind. Sure. You go to. You go to. Do you have uh, another surprise guest? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is it, boys. <laughs> Andy oh, Kern's gonna pop in any second. I can yeah. feel Sean it. Sean Kelly, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I, 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 sh- I should have reached out to him. I could have just left and then came back an hour later. <laughs> and then say, hey, thanks for coming out, folks. Um, so then you go to like an album like Diver Down, and the opening tune is the right song, which is well, the original, which is Where Have All the Good Times Gone, followed by Little Guitars, Hang 'em High, Secrets, Intruder, Oh Pretty Women, Big Bad Bill, Dancing in the Street cathedral happy trails and the full bug wow yeah. wow yeah see happy tra- happy trail should be last yeah but is, on here it's printed so is, it, is that is it printed that way or is it actually this the sequence of that record That's well it's just so printed weird. that way on the back of the the album oh, cover sorry. Yeah. Okay. sorry that's, sorry sorry that's what i meant was oh because you know yeah, you buy yeah. a lot of records and the songs will be in the right order Right. Okay. Right. See, that's that's what Rick Emmett calls the tune stack. It's just like the list of songs, not in the order that you hear them on the album. Ah. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay. No, I, I didn't don't know that. I, I. You know what, dude? I had no idea that that went on. Like I thought they were all. It's kind of like on this, Yeah, on the cassette, they're all in in proper order. Yeah. I wonder that's what really why weird. what what do you think the reason for that would be? It's kind of weird. 
I didn't yeah. even know well, what I, was going on. Yeah, I just remember just reading it in the, the Ted Templeman book where he talked about it. Like he said, they would sit there in the studio and say, yeah, yeah, because they'd have the record company art department saying, hey, hey, we need we need something here. We got to get the album moving here. Da, 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 da. Give us the song titles. Okay, well, this is the song titles. And they would say that would be the kind of the order that they're looking at. And then by the time you get a copy in your hands, it's right switched around. Right. It, it's funny when you showed that diver down the cover of that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, how plain is that? Eh? Wow. Yeah. But that's what hooked me. Yeah. 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 yeah you know, crowd. Unbelievable, man. Yeah. And that's, that's them opening for the stones. Oh, wow. You know, what's cool. You know, what's cool about that record cover. Uh, I mean, it's, it's plain and it's boring, but that is the, <laughs> that is the flag. Uh, that symbolizes that there's actually a diver in the water. So turn your engines off. And oh. so somebody asked, yeah. So that's a that's a proper flag in the nautical world. So if you're a, if you're boating and you see that, that means there's a diver underwater. So turn off your motor because you might cut him up with it. Wow. So an interviewer asked Dave because there was a lot of turbulence going on with Van Halen at the time, and somebody said, "What's with the diver down?" You know, cover. And he said, "Well." Sometimes things below are not as they appear above. So he was alluding to the fact that they were fighting. Right. Okay. The band was actually breaking up. So stuff was going on under the surface. And that's where that came from, apparently. Huh. Oh, man. Yeah. Brent's yeah. so deep, man. He knows everything. You can... <laughs> and, see, and see, Phrase, that's why I brought him on. He's the ringer here. Oh, man. He's the ringer. Jeez. He's a ringer. <laughs> like, yep, that's just the stuff we're looking that, for in here. Everybody you know. knew that. <laughs> Not no, me. <laughs> no, no. So, yeah. So, going back to the the debut album, um, Brent. So you discovered it in 1979. Phrase mm -hmm. discovered it right off the hop in '78. Oh, yeah. um, believe it or not, I'm. You guys can cut me off here, but I never bought it until. The debut until after the 84 album came out why i have no idea because i bought women and children um in early 1981 and i, I couldn't believe the sound of that guitar because i was coming mm. from listening to cheap trick kiss queen and then you hear this rip snorting guitar raw sounding and you hear this singer at the beginning of everybody wants some sounding like some primal tarzan doing the yodeling yeah. like it just blew my little mind and then three months later out comes fair warning you know and i i always ask myself why was i so late on the trot getting the I, I'm, I'm wondering because living in thunder bay which you know some people that might be watching or listening to this podcast is way way up northern ontario i live in niagara falls i think that's like a, a 22 hour drive if i'm not yeah. mistaken it's for me to drive from here to Thunder Bay is the same as for me driving from here to Florida. It's the same distance. Can you believe that? But I'm, I'm pretty wow. sure I'm sure back in those days, you know, in 1978, you probably didn't have Q107 and Chum FM. Like you didn't have major FM radio stations up there. So you were you probably weren't exposed to like you probably couldn't hear them on the radio where I was being in. I'm so close to Buffalo. You know, I would hear like UFO and early Scorpions and early Judas Priest and early UFO stuff you would never hear in Ontario. You'd never hear it in Q107 and Chum FM and all that kind of stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I I heard it right away. I'm, I'm kind of lucky on that aspect. So I'm, I'm sure that's probably part of it, man. You know, hey, and, Grace, do you and, remember uh, from 97 Rock? Do you remember? Do you remember Slick Tom? Slick Tom. Well, I, I remember Carl Russo. He's still there. He's Slick still there. Tom. Yeah, Slick, Slick Tom's Tom. a, he's, he's a nighttime guy. And okay, his, he, you know, he, you talk about my voice, his voice is like three octaves lower than mine. <laughs> okay, like, wow, it's like daddy, and it like, but he was so cool because he's just he talked really deliberately and kind of in this really deep voice. And uh, you know, he would have this call in show, he, he, he played all the great songs too, but like people would call in and he'd like, you know, kind of make fun of them and stuff like that. Right, and uh, he was just like this really funny dude, Slick Tom, and he's still there, actually. Wow, Jesus, yeah. 
Well, you do have a good voice, like for radio. I, I'm serious. All joking aside, you could do voiceover work and stuff like that with that voice, man. I'm serious. Hey. Thanks, man. I have you're, done some. I, I, oh, have you? I was going to say, because you, you're yeah. leaving money on the table if you're not. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't say that phrase because I don't want him to start charging me every time I ask him to come on. The, the Where's on my the check, Deke? <laughs> well, <laughs> I owe you. <laughs> I owe you. But, um, yeah, I mean, what can you say about the, the debut Van Halen album? I mean, it's just such an all-time great killer record. I It's just one of the all-time greats. Now, Brent, I have to ask you now, you know, you know how many times I've read No Sleep to Sudbury. I got it. I got it. I got both of his books. They're awesome. Oh, wow. You do? Yeah, you signed them. You don't remember? Oh, that's right. I do remember that. <laughs> and that I, gave you, I gave you I gave you Phrase Gang CDs. That's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and a Storm Force CD, which my name is on, and like that there was you a go. huge privilege for me. So thank yeah. you for, again for that. That was fantastic. Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry, I, I I cut into your questions. No, so no, it's all good. good. No, I have to ask Brent. Now, when you first listened to Van Halen, the debut, did you go to track two? uh eruption you mean yeah because i remember reading in no sleep the sudbury you say a lot of uh, times you would start at track two see i'm calling you out right. here <laughs> so that's that's funny because I, I completely forgot about that um <laughs> that didn't apply to every record ah. uh when i was a kid i didn't have that much kind of forethought i just like press ah. play and kind of yeah. let things you know kind of scramble my brain but um, it was only until I was a more discriminant listener when I was in you know high school, later high school, that and the theory phrase, basically what we're talking about is like I, I always thought that, and again back to sequencing, which I could talk about for like a day. Um, the first song on most records is almost like the commercial for the record. That was my sure. theory. So I used to skip it oh, because wow. I always found that I would like the second song. And the third song was typically the single. So like Out of the Cellar, for example, you know, Round and Round was track three. And so I'd okay. go right to that, right? And the Cinderella records. and But actually the Cinderella record turned me around because that was a good one-two punch. That was Night Songs and Shake right? Me, yeah, which was amazing, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, they, I, I'm trying to, I don't know. It was, it was older records. Anyway, to answer your question, very long answer, sorry. Um, I no, I did not skip. But I will tell you that Eruption, even in my young mind, I thought this guy is truly redefining the possibilities of what it means to play guitar. Like he really is, if it's, that is a guitar. Yeah, like, like I mentioned before, being a guitar player, I, I thought it was all fake because like I mentioned, you, there was no video. I mean, all you see is some, some photos. And even then, because they were so new, they, they weren't really in the magazines yet. You know, might, maybe a little blurb. So you had no, so when I heard Eruption, I thought it was, like I mentioned, guitar synthesizer. I thought that he's not playing that. Like, it's got to be some yeah. weird effects and stuff. And yeah. And yeah. I got to admit, though, when I when I did, I wasn't crazy about Roth. The Roth wasn't an immediate like, you really? know. No, no. Because I like, I like, I came from the Paul Rogers and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, and, 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 and Robert Plant and Freddie Mercury and, you know, even Steve Perry and Lou Graham, yeah. and, you know, the guys that genuine singers. I found Roth that it, at first he kind of turned me off because he was playing for the girls. Yeah. You know what I mean? He yeah. wasn't playing for the guys. He couldn't care about the guys. He was, it was all about the girls. Yeah. And, yeah. and being, and I go, he's not a musician. He's not a musician. He's just, he's just in it for the girls. Eddie's the guy, right? Eddie's the guy. So everything was all mm -hmm. on Eddie. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So it took me a while to really, you know, appreciate Roth. I mean, what was the second or was the third record where you opened it up and he's got a poster yeah. with and Roth chains. and those and chains. It's like, come on, yeah. what the heck is that? You know, what guy's going to, what guy's going to put that on their wall? Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. And, and I remember buying that record and I still remember the sticker to this day. It said Van Halen poster included. And right. I thought, oh, and I got home and I ripped it open. <laughs> right. no, yeah. David Lee Roth poster included. Yeah. I, I can't see Eddie going, yeah, good idea. Let's do that, Dave. Yeah. Let's yeah, do I heard, it. Yeah. I heard that. I heard that was, I read that became a, a big issue at that. Um, at that time when they were doing the photographs for the record. 
Oh, uh, for sure. They were doing yes. band photos. The next thing you know, they took them over to the side and did the old chain link fence thing. And uh, yep. that's what ended up in the record. So obviously, it's like you said, Phrase, they're probably, the record company is probably, you know, targeting a different audience for Van Halen as in mm-hmm. males. And then you have Eddie with uh, the guitar rock bringing in the guys. Yeah, so, yeah. But, yeah. As a, but as a band entity, that's not a Van Halen poster. No. <laughs> oh, and, no. And, th- and if you got to remember, too, like I mentioned back in 78, disco was king. I mean, staying alive was number one, you know, like yeah, the Bee Gees were number one everywhere. You know, everybody had the John Travolta haircut in my school, like 95 percent of air, all the guys had that haircut, you know, and then there's a, yep. sm- a small pocket of this with the long hair. And, you know, and uh, so and if you if you really think about that first Van Halen record, there's not real singles on there. You know what I mean? They, all the songs are fantastic, but there's not an obvious single. Like, wow, this is that would fit on the radio on, amongst all these other, you know, like the Bee Gees and stuff like that. I think the big song in '78 uh, was uh, "We Will Rock You" by Queen. That was on the radio. Mm-hmm. But other than that, there wasn't a lot of rock songs. Maybe Sticks might have had a couple on there back then. Maybe Kansas. But uh, it was it was a tough sell. I mean, even punk was was still sticking around a bit. You know, they weren't on the radio much. But Van Halen was kind of on their own. Um, you know, people don't realize that the Sunset Strip wasn't happening the way it was in the early '80s. Back in 1978, it was just Van Halen, maybe Quiet Riot, and a couple of other ones that made it through. I mean, other than that, who 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 from L- Los Angeles was huge, other than Van Halen at that time? nobody really I can think of no no I think you're right that was a dry spell for sure right because if you go back a lot of years you know that the Sunset Strip was the doors and like those bands yeah and it kind of it dried up until you know the 80s really in the late 70s and Van Absolutely. Halen used to play the, the Starwood all the time in the Troubadour right Troubadour yep um and Dokken was a band that played but like they were still not getting a lot of attention no, yeah. no, no, no. I mean, their, their first major single was Jump, if you think about it. I mean, the second record, uh, what was the big single off of that? Maybe Dance the Night Away. Yeah. It was it was kind of yeah. single-ish. You could tell they're yeah. trying to get more on the radio. They're kind of lighting it up a bit. But yeah. uh, but they weren't a single type of band, you know, And because it was all about Eddie, man. What he was doing was just unbelievable, like out of this world. I mean, it's still blows me away you know and even he looked so cool too you know what i mean like everything about him he had great hair he had a, he had a good look you know had that oh, yeah. smile he had that smile yeah. on his face and they're one of the first bands that generally like you mentioned you said it looked like i was generally having a good time they yeah. were like and, and they were like that too i mean you see i i gotta admit it rubbed off me when i seen van Halen back in 78 because they were like oh my god i think these guys are just having the time they couldn't smile anymore there they could tell like man this is so awesome to be on this big stage in front of 10 12 000 people and uh oh yeah after that show i was going cool. and by the way because they you know that first van halen record is probably 35 minutes long and mm. you know right and i think their set would have been 45 minutes so they had to do another song so they said we're going to do a song coming from our second record called bottoms up Oh wow! Yeah, so I heard That's "Bottoms cool. Up" before it was even <laughs> even recorded, and I remember one part of the show too. Eddie, uh, his head went down. I can't remember what song it was. So all of a sudden, there's no guitar, and then Rod, oh. we got some mechanical difficulties <laughs> at the moment. I tell you, I tell you, all right, you know. Then and then and then Michael and Anthony, they kept going without the guitar, and then and then Roth would start doing like. Mm-hmm. And, and then all of a sudden, Eddie's comes back in, and instead of going back in the song, he starts playing off of Dave, and and he started doing back, and then he get somehow they got right back into this. It's almost looked like it was planned, but I know it wasn't. So that was that. That was really cool too. So, yeah, that is a great, great band. You know, musicians that are able to do that right on the just oh on yeah. The spot, well, that, you well, you know, and, and that's that's a perfect example of of, of a band that played lots they, where you could mm. you, you know what i mean you can't if you're a band that hardly plays live a lot just plays in your basement 
stuff like that could really throw you off. I was like, oh my God, you know, and everything could so, stop, yeah. stop. And everything, we don't know what to do, right? These guys, the, they just kept it going, man. The drums kept playing, bass kept playing, and he and, and Ross started talking to people and just kept it going, man. And that's just from playing millions and millions of gigs. And, you know, Brighton Rock were lucky enough to do that in being in Canada where you could play six nights a week, like literally yeah. play every single night of the week, week after week, month after month, year after year. So, you know, when we'd play live, it was like second nature to us. We didn't even have to think about what, what you're playing. It's, it's all about, hey, man, just go have a good time. I could have a conversation on stage and – and not even realize what I'm playing because I know what I'm playing is right because I've played it so many times. You know what I mean? And that's what you want. That's what you want to be able to do. You, you want to be. You don't want to be like just focused. Okay, what's the, you know what I mean? You're just sitting there playing. Okay, what's the next part? You know, that's that's boring for the crowd, right? You mm -hmm. lose the crowd. You got to be able to, you know. So, anyways, yeah. See that that's that's honing your craft, phrase. Uh, that, and that's in that's a, you know. That, it, that's a, a lost art, I will say, you know, well, without sounding it, like that guy who's shaking his fist and, you know, get off my lawn. Like that is a lost art, I believe. And I think that you would probably agree. Absolutely. Because if you listen to the, or, or even read some early Van Halen interviews, you would, see, you would see, hear them saying like, we played anywhere, man. We play in somebody's keg party. We play in your backyard. We play anywhere just to play, 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 play. And that's what you need. You know, you have yeah. to get out there. I mean, I uh, hear some of these young bands, oh, the, they don't want to pay us. They, you know, they want us to play for $100. Screw those guys. Like, okay, whatever, man. You know, yeah. no matter how good you play your instrument, you got to stage craft is an art in itself. You got to be able to totally. win it. You got to win a crowd over, not by your, not everybody out there is a guitar fan. You know what I'm saying? Not everybody else there is a drum fan. They don't care. They want to visually see something that, that they want to see some emotion. They want to feel some emotion. You got to be able to win a crowd over, especially if they don't know who you are. You're an opening mm -hmm. band. They're there to see the headliner. It's like, who are these guys? Well, okay, man, we have to win you over in 30 minutes or 45 minutes. So we're going to do everything possible to do that. And we're going to, and we would attack the stage like we're going on the ice and playing against another hockey team. That's the way we approached it, like full tilt, man. We were to not just give it all on the stage. And uh, like you mentioned, that's a lost art, you know. So we would play, yes. play as much as possible. You can't, you can't learn that kind of stuff in your in your rehearsal hall in your basement. You got to go there and play as much as possible, no matter where it is. Totally. Yeah. You know? One of the coolest things I'd ever seen is Carl Dixon, Coney Hatch, uh, was playing an acoustic show live, and uh, he broke his string. Oh, and I. I Okay. You know the story? Well, Isn't no. I, the... You know, it's funny because so, I, I did a show with Carl. We did an acoustic mm -hmm. show. Uh, it was me on acoustic, Carl on acoustic, and a, 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 one of my friends in Phrase Gang, uh, yeah. D Derek McGowan. But Carl did the first eight songs by himself. And I know what yep. you say. He broke a string. And you want to yep. finish the story or what? Sure. Okay. He broke into "He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother" by the Hollies a cappella. That's right. Just yep. yep. It, it just like so he he realized he'd broken the string and didn't miss a beat. Didn't he take looked, a break. Nope. Didn't say I'm gonna put the guitar. Like, where's the string? Like what? Hank, can someone help me? Right. Yep. He just said he started taking it out and he said uh, I can't remember how he he just he, he went into it and I just thought this is amazing. Yeah. And I, 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 I'll never forget that. And then yeah. this, it was tuned and, and you didn't really, you know, and then he just he went right back into the song and kept going. And it was just seamless. And I thought, I know. that is a lost art right there. That is a pro. You know what I mean? That's what pro that's is, a pro. Man. There's a guy yeah. that's been on stage thousands of times, you know, for years, yeah. decades. And uh, That's a guy and, who put in his 10,000 hours of time. And it's a shame because, like, now – live music is not being supported like that anymore. You can't play six nights a week anymore. You're lucky if you can play a couple mm -hmm. of shows a month. You know what I mean? So you can't hone, hone your craft stage wise anymore. So especially young bands today, you know, I, I kind of feel sorry for them because, you know, they're going to get an opportunity one day. Say, hey man, you're going to be open for whoever, whoever the new big band is. And uh, they're going to be up there and they're going to be shocked. It's like, Oh my God, look how big the stage is. It's a lot different than our basement. Right? Like, and everything sounds different. You know, you get you get on big stages like that, you know, like now they have in-ear monitors, which I, I don't use, but you have you have a lot of what you call dead spots 
on mm-hmm. the stage. So you can be in front of your amp and all of a sudden you go be in between your amp and the drums and there's a dead spot. Now you literally can't hear your amp at all. You're, all you hear is from the, from the, the PA, the back of the room. Oh. There's, no, there's no distinction on the big stages, right? So you have all these dead spots. And if you're not prepared for that kind of stuff, it'll throw you a curve. You're like, whoa, what the heck, man? So, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, that'll <laughs> that'll really throw a curveball at you, man. So, yeah, you got to so, really. So, so for you, Phrase, when you were, you know, playing the biggest stages, were there sweet spots on the stage where you would go, like, for a solo and, um, you know, wherever, how the amps were positioned? Like, was there a spot you preferred to play that you could hear and maybe you get a little bit more out of your harmonics and stuff like that? Well, yeah, the sweet spots would be more a little to the right of my amp. I didn't want to be right in front of my amps because then it's a little too harsh sounding. So, but you know, you can't stand in front of your amp all night, so you'd have to move around. So, our, our the guy who would do our monitors, I would go like to the middle monitor where Jerry would be singing, and then all of a sudden you hear my guitar coming through that monitor, and mm-hmm. then and when I'd walk away, he'd shut it back down because Jerry wouldn't want to hear my guitar through his monitor. I'd go to the other side of the stage, you could hear. So that kind of stuff helped. But uh, it, it would never sound as good in, in front of your amp. But uh, you got to remember mm. that a lot of those huge stages we played, like when we toured with Triumph, you know, we played Maple Leaf Gardens, Montreal Forum, Ottawa, uh, Civic Center, Quebec Coliseum, London Gardens, Halifax Metro Center, like all these places, Kitchener Rod. They're huge stages. And yeah. uh, so we're the opening band. So we don't get lots of sound check and stuff like that. Okay, guys. Doors are opening 10 minutes. Get your stuff on stage. It's like, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what sometimes would happen, literally, you know, because because they, they, they'd go, you know, they'd try and be doing their sound check and things, you know, the lights wouldn't be working, something, the lasers wouldn't. So it's, it would take, sometimes you'd have parts would take a lot longer. Yeah. So then, so sometimes you wouldn't even have a line check. You'd literally just get your stuff on stage and hope for the best. Oh, so wow. All that happens more than you know. You have no idea, man. Wow. You have no idea. I remember we're, I won't even name the Canadian band. They were kind of, uh, I won't say who they are, but th- <laughs> they would finish their sound check and then it would be, okay, we're going to have a supper break for the crew. And they didn't want to hear any music, no nothing. So we'd be sitting there going, are you serious? So they, the, the crew would be eating their supper. Okay, guys, got half an hour, get your stuff going. Uh, and, and then, you know, we're frantically trying to get everything coming through so we can hear the monitors and you know stuff like that they're playing with you right because they're afraid we're gonna blow them off the stage <laughs> and i hope you did yeah well we we definitely outsold in merch almost every single night i'll tell you good, that. <laughs> no, man, good. there you go and that's like you said you, you come out with the, the hockey player mentality you know you guys just get out there and just throw it all to the go wind and just give her man and, oh man you know like there's nights where you know like, you can't call in sick you know, you got the mm. flu. It doesn't matter. You're playing. You can't call. You can't not do the gig. And sheer adrenaline, you'd be on, like, you'd be going, oh, my God, I can't believe I, I got to go on stage. All of a sudden, boom, you're on stage. It's like this adrenaline takes over, and it carries you through the set. And it's like, and then you get backstage, it's like, what's wrong with Phrase? Oh, he's sick. What? He's sick. You'd never know it by looking on stage, you know, so... It just, you know, you have to push through those kind of things, you know? Mm. Yeah. The show must go on. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, man. That's awesome. And, and like, you guys talking about, you know, playing all those shows and uh, stuff, like you said, with Van Halen, their gear breaking down or Eddie's gear breaking down. Thing. I mean, I saw that. I, I, I can honestly say I saw it once for sure, and that's when um, – the Canadian guitar player uh, David Gogo was here okay. when he was on his debut record. Uh, I remember him. Yeah, he had the big tune there at the time called Deep End. Very great track. Yep. He came here and he played a bar, and um, he was playing the show. And next thing you know, what the the bassist and drummer went into this crazy, like almost Chili Pepper funk, do do do. You know, just just jamming away. So at the end of the show, we, we met Dave, you know, we buying CDs and he's signing them for us. And we said, Oh, you know, that was pretty cool. Da, 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 da. You know, your bass player and drummer went into this thing. And he goes, yeah, man, my rig shut down. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Whoa. yeah. yeah. Wow. There, you, there okay. you go. So, and you know what? We just thought it was part of the show. 
you know. Well, we, we, we used to have little backups like that too. Uh, you yeah. know, something would happen with my amp. You all of a sudden you'd hear screams go, do, 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 Or no, I'm trying to think of Billy Jean. How's Billy Jean go? Uh, <laughs> kind of like that. Yeah, kind of like do, that. Do, 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 do. Yeah, that was that. Right. Was- all right, so people are going, I can't believe it. And all of a sudden, Jerry would start singing Michael Jackson, but he would nail it. People would go, wait a minute. Like, you know, it's funny, but he actually sounds pretty damn good, man. And people were like, you know, they're going along and then give me time to get whatever I broke a string or whatever happened, you know. So, yeah. And then same with Screams. He breaks down or something like that. Okay, me and Jerry would start doing some old Jimmy Page rubber plant, you know. <laughs> You know, back and forth, little stuff like that to carry the. You know, you don't want dead spots, right? For sure. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's yeah. But like I mentioned, that that's that's you can only do that by doing multiple, multiple year after year, like just every night, play, 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 no matter what. I mean, I remember one time we we did a gig, uh, we were still called Heart Attack, and uh, we're playing this club, really small club. Nobody knew who we were, and there was a pool tournament going on, right? So they. I guess it was going longer that we were supposed to be on stage at nine. Now it's like quarter after nine and it's still going on. They haven't de- declared the winner. So they're, you know, okay, just go on, but keep it low and everything. So we're literally, it's still too loud, still too loud. It's like, what? So literally we had nothing coming out of the PA. The vocal monitor was face outward and the just stage volume. Th- this is how we're playing the set. And it just sounded awful. And people, and then the owner goes, it's still too loud. It's like, well, what do we do here? Right. But we still yeah. did the gig, man. We still had to get through the gig, you know. Those are those are gigs. Find a top story. <laughs> oh, I, I, I remember one time too. We played. Uh, we, we were headlining some university, and opening the show was a Rod Stewart tribute, right? Ooh. And the guy looked like Rod Stewart. I guess he. So, anyways, uh, our our stage manager comes backstage. And goes, you're not gonna believe how many women are out there tonight, man. Like, I it's just nothing but women out there. We're going really. Oh wow, whatever. All right, cool. So we go on. So Rod Stewart finishes. Then we come on stage. Three quarters of the crowd is emptied out. They were just there to see him. We come on. It's like where are to go? And we're the headliners. <laughs> yeah, it's like. I'll never forget that. Everybody just left me. Eh? Oh, but hey, you still gotta you gotta still gotta soldier on, man. That's right. Uh, that's that's uh, so awesome. So, um, <laughs> you know what, phrase? I really, really want to thank you for uh, coming on once again and being such a great sport. And thank you so much for the the backstories on how the debut Van Halen album impacted you as a fan, a listener, and as a musician and uh that's one of the main reasons was i wanted to get an actual musician on here and kind of kind of go through the record a little bit and talk about the impact it had on you and you can tell from like all three of us i think that van halen album is you know still a pretty big part of our lives and absolutely Brent, Brent, i always i always appreciate man whenever i reach out to you you're always there for me pal so uh happy to do it yeah wow. so you know what i'm gonna I'm finishing up this episode and I'm taking a break for the summer, but in the fall, I would love to have both of you guys back on. And Absolutely. Sure, man. I would pick it's out fun. another record, maybe something like UFO Strangers in the Night, which I know oh. is another phrase. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. uh, oh my God. There's you know. a ma- another masterpiece, man. I mean, don't get me started on that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's pump the brakes there for a second. And uh, <laughs> okay. you know what, boys? Uh, seriously, thanks so much. Um, I'm just going to wrap things up here. If you guys wouldn't mind just staying on for a quick sure sure all right everybody so thanks for you know joining me and watching uh the last eight nine months of doing scotch on the rocks totally appreciate it i'd like to thank everybody that has come on um you know who you are and i thank you very much and i could go down the list and then i would feel like a piece of crap if i forgot somebody so Right. right so you guys all know and thanks for the support and uh the good vibes and whatnot so we'll see you in the fall so Have a good summer, folks, and we'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. Cheers. Cheers.